Hallo. Hallo. Vielen Dank für diesen fantastischen, Thank you for this fantastic, warmen Applaus. Warm applause. Zu Beginn meiner At the start keynote. of my Warum keynote, why are we here actually? The current change of society, economy and communication, that is the title of the talk that I will be giving for the next four hours. And I have to admit it's not exactly four hours, but it feels feel like that. It's one hour that we in the classical internet sense of I will need because we will have a long arc from, well, it's not just going to be about why we are here and with the we, I mean us, the Republica people, but also, as you can see in the subtitle, also what is happening out there. Because what is happening out there is, well, the pandemic that through a miracle was over at the moment the Ukraine was invaded, that is just at its beginning, as a track before the track, what I want to get onto. If I talk about change, there is a place where this change through the pandemic was to be felt most intensely, where most things changed. And that, I think, is in the understanding of the people out there. Of course, we have known all along, but in the understanding of the people outside, a huge thing, a huge number of things changed. Through the pandemic, things were possible that seemed impossible before in the digital sphere. People in 2019 said, well, in our industry, home office is completely impossible. We are a people's industry, and suddenly it was possible. And I brought a symbol along for what has changed in our heads, which through the pandemic has changed in our world view and the view of the world of the people outside. And that symbol is a headline from the Zeit newspaper, which before Corona you couldn't have ever understood. And that is how dangerous are door handles. I was wondering what would people have thought before that? What meaning would they have ascribed to this? Maybe the parents among you, I am a new parent, I have brought some proof. Uh, the parents among you would have thought, ah, well, if, if, children, re if children reach the uh, appropriate age, maybe the door handle is at eye level or something. But these days it's completely clear what is behind this headline. The pandemic, therefore, has shifted the, our view of the world without us really noticing, and that also applies to the digital context, not just the physical door handle context. So the, the most funny thing perhaps I found that before the pandemic you wouldn't have ever understood is a headline from the Südkurie, which is 40 rolls of loop were stolen from Karpfenburg Castle. I would have never understood that before the pandemic, and that's a symbol that we are looking at the world in a different way now, and also in the digital context. And now we get to the downer that traditionally is at the beginning of my Republica. This is the applause for it, uh, which is at the beginning of my Republica speech, and that is a short content track that I have mentioned or had before, and that I will always bring along, because this speech is not just for you, but also for the people out there, the people out there that maybe not like us, the Republica people that used to be the digital avant-garde, the really we, the weedom, maybe the people outside did notice during the pandemic, oh shit, the track that I have brought along several times is about the gruesome German digital infrastructure, and I will keep putting this to you until someone acts as if they are responsible. But of course, I also know even a, a, just a gut feeling won't get us very far. It's all terrible, yes, and people keep thinking it's getting so slow and you can't even uh, have seven HD streams at one time. But I want to add a few numbers to the gut feeling so that even the people outside will notice, oh, it's not just a coincidence that in 2020, when I tried a video conference for the first time, 300 meters outside the town center, the video always had to be switched off. 
for that to function. And the horrific German digital infrastructure, I have good numbers that were published just before the pandemic, the pandemic about the absolute future of the infrastructure, the digitality, and that, of course, is fiber into the home fiber up into into the home, fiber to the home and fiber to the building, to use the precise business terms. The source is the Fiber to the Home Council Europe. Directly before the pandemic, they published, and I'm going to illustrate this with a chart, and of course, this chart is much too small. You can't even read it in the first row, and not even if you're watching it on the screens. So I'm going to lead you through the reality of digital infrastructure in Germany, because what is put down here is the permeation of fiber to the home in various countries. And we see up at the top, at 100%, the United Arab Emirates, and then Qatar, Singapore, yeah, these are small countries, of course, but then there is China, 90%, and China isn't really a city-state, is it? South Korea, Hong Kong, Japan, Mauritius, New Zealand, Germany, of course, wasn't mentioned. You would have guessed that anyway, wouldn't you? It's not a complete surprise that I'm bringing you here. Fiber to the home is the absolute future of the technology of what infrastructure could be. And maybe 5G and, and, 5G and maybe 6G will depend on this. So Germany wasn't included in the list yet. Let's go down. Uh, Latvia, Thailand, Lithuania, Spain, Sweden. Ah, we are entering the EU now. We are at about 50%. Uh, and in the EU, uh, Sweden and Spain, it works. Vietnam, Belarus, Romania, okay. Germany wasn't mentioned yet. Well, it's just the first page, though, is it? Isn't it? Uh, so let's move on to the second page, which is even smaller. Uh, even I have to lead you even more through that. This is how it looks. Estonia, Finland, Slovakia, uh, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Trinidad and Tobago. So Trinidad and Tobago, maybe that will make you wonder. Germany hasn't been mentioned yet, a very rich country, and Trinidad and Tobago is an insular state in the ocean. I don't know. Maybe the uh, rich and densely populated country, Germany, that has a certain value on its infrastructure should be a bit more in front, Denmark, Jamaica, Hungary, Australia, Kazakhstan. And that's where you get angry, kind of. Really, honestly. You do know this. Kazakhstan is a huge country with very few inhabitants. So obviously, they, with their huge area and the very few people, have managed to reach a, a portion of fiber infrastructure larger than Germany, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, the United States, Canada, and then the EU average somewhere, Germany wasn't mentioned yet, Ukraine, Oman, Chile, Kuwait, Poland, South Africa, Puerto Rico, Germany not mentioned yet, and that's because Germany isn't actually in this list, because Germany in 2018, for the first time, went above the measurability threshold, so just before the pandemic, they managed to get on a par with Angola. And nothing to be said against Angola. It's a fantastic country, but the gross domestic product per head is about $3,000 per year. That is about a 15th of the German figure, the gross domestic product per head, per capita. And at the same time, we have to see that as a Late consequence of colonialism in 1961, Angola had almost continuous war. There was a war of independence, which then uh, almost seamlessly went into a civil war through the, a coup in the colonial power, the former colonial power, Portugal, and that went on until 2002. Having that in the back of your head, you have to realize that the infrastructure, as a late consequence of colonialism, means that only 50% of households have running water, but fiber to the home, they're at the same level as Germany. 
And that is, in fact, something that you really have to think about twice. And the first thing is, of course, that you have to be very much more offensive in dealing with colonialism and its many effects, be they migration, ethnic conflicts, economic problems that lead into very unfavorable contracts, for example, with the EU, and that immediately mean that Germany has a miserable digital infrastructure, as everyone knows, that is sitting in a regional train between two cities and is trying with their mobile phone to do anything at all. And I am just like you. We Republica people, just like you, I am a convinced optimist. I am hugely optimistic. And I try, therefore, because I am an optimist, even in the worst of circumstances and silliest of situations, I try to see some positive aspect. Often it is the case that difficult, stupid things are just the consequence of something good. Germany, for example, well, we may not have a good infra fiber infrastructure, but maybe that is for a positive reason, because we know that Germany has never been the country of speed if you disregard the motorways, perhaps. So Germany isn't a very fast country, especially in transformation, because there are other important values, so cleanliness, thoroughness, and that all takes time. And, well, maybe Germany simply, in its thoroughness and its meticulousness, was surprised by the need for fiber infrastructure. And then we thought, oh dear, for God's sake, now we are going to catch up at great speed and, and build fiber. Maybe it was a very late realization, but I have a quote from the Spiegel magazine that wrote just about just that, about the old 20th century technology, copper versus the new technology, fiber. And this quote from Spiegel, the German news magazine, I would like to sketch regarding Regarding German infrastructure, this risky decision to put billions into copper even now was met with surprise even in faraway Japan, where they considered it a, a long-term wrong decision that they would like to keep with copper in Germany and not convert the new systems to fiber technology. Okay. That is exactly what you would have expected Spiegel to write about fiber infrastructure, but the problem is, this is actually true, you can Google it, this quote that Spiegel published in January 1983. And that means that since for about 40 years, the highly te technolo technologist outside has been looking at us and wondering when will we start with reasonable infrastructure and we still haven't managed. And maybe there are deep, deeper reasons even for that, because I'm very grateful, for example, that someone called Jürgen Bethke a few years ago found out that in 1981, Helmut Schmidt, the then chancellor, introduced a plan to the cabinet according to which Germany would become become the fiber leader. Jürgen Beck in the Wirtschaftswoche magazine uh, researched this in old documents and archives. In 1981, the plan was that every year, three billion German marks would have been invested into fiber infrastructure. But then Helmut Kohl became chancellor and he introduced private TV. The first answer to the question why we are here, therefore, is, among others, because private television was introduced by Helmut Kohl, the conservative chancellor from 1983. So we're moving forward and we'll look what is actually happening out there and this progress that is palpable even here, even for us people at the Republica, and I'm going to ask what actually drives the change of society, economy and communication. And this term change needs getting used to, I have to admit, but I do believe that it's just not one change, but various changes. And I even looked at the famous German dictionary, the Duden, for the word Wandel, change. There is no plural. So the fantastic Ronja Othmann, I uh, took to uh, let her lead me. She wrote a novel called Die Sommer, which is plural, and Sommer is singular. So that was many summers. So I'm going to say Die Wandel, plural, Die, and then Wandel change. And I'll ask what actually drives this. And the answer I'm going to give leads us into back to the year 1970. We were at 1981. Now we go back to 1970, but not to Germany, but to Oregon, and to be precise, to the University of Oregon. 
There, the university um, heads were struggling with um, students who were not happy. That was not just because they were sad that the 60s were over. It was also because um, they got a new dorm, which they didn't really like because it was built in the style of brutalism and looked like this. So you can imagine why people didn't feel so well there. So what did the university um, heads do in order to drive change? Um, and be a driver of change in communication. So they said, we'll rearrange campus, not the building, but um, what is between the buildings. And that was introduced by a Vienna architect called Christoph Alexander. And he sat together with the students and they just planarized um, the whole um, area. They just leveled it and flattened it to the ground. And then it became exciting because the students uh, sowed grass on the leveled plain. And then they waited for six months and where they um, created paths where the grass had been trodden down. So this is, those are the most efficient paths that you can imagine. And I'm ready to bet that every, like the best architects in the world um, would have done it exactly the same because um, it's just the most efficient conceivable path network, and it was created by everyone by means of the right technology. Back then, it was grass. The lawn acted as a anonymous user data collection, very clear, and it found the most efficient paths. And this is what we want to look at when looking at drivers of change, that the data of the many brings an information and a power that single individuals can't reach. Slow clap. Slow clap. I love those the most. Das ist also das, was aus meiner Sicht dahinter steht. Die schlichte Erkenntnis, dass this is what is behind it. Just simply knowing that many people can drive change naturally. So it's not something I would say we saw, especially during the pandemic. Um, without pressure, change often takes too much time. In Germany, we're great at being stubborn, especially when it comes to digital technology. So without pressure, it takes us ages to change. So let's take home office as an example. What was um, able to be achieved by pressure, something that people were convinced wouldn't work and fought so hard against, and then in 2020 it worked. So I found another photo that you wouldn't have understood before the pandemic, the photo of a meeting room, and on the meeting room, you can see a sign that says, only one person in this meeting room at a time. Before the pandemic, you wouldn't have known what the heck that sign was about. So when we're talking about the power of interlinking, it's multidimensional, not one-dimensional. And to be precise, I believe it's a thesis. I would um, like to have this treated as a thesis. I think there are such things as um, natural powers of digitalization. So digital natural powers, some principles and powers that enforce or almost enforce changes. And one of those 
how is. I want to go into a little more detail on, because it's very nice to understand. It's the um, tellability and the power of tellability. It's very nice, um, nicely illustrated by um, something that happened in December 2007 in the Republica context. Of course, I'm talking about the Perkanat example in 2007. In December 2007, a Twitter user named Malix wanted to contact a Twitter user called Perkanta. In 2007, in December, also because of the Republika, many people got used to Twitter in Germany. So in 2007, there was 5,000 active Twitter users in Germany. And at the same time, we had 120 um, so, Malix wanted to contact Perkanta, and in, instead of Perkanta, he wrote Perkanat. That, that was a term that didn't exist before. It has had no Google hits. So, that is something that just didn't exist. And then something happened that illustrates tellability very well, especially in um, the internet. It became a meme because someone thought Pekanat, that sounds like a dog and uh, made jokes like 200 milligrams of Pekanat and uh, your headache is gone. And uh, and another complaint that he had to help his father um, lay out the Perkanat on the floor all day. So this outlines very well the power of tellability. Because um, from zero Google hits, it reached... Uh, 45,000 Google hits all of a sudden with only 5,000 active Twitter users. What does that mean? That means that with tellability, something became that hadn't been there before. That was Perkanat, and people um, searched for the term because they weren't sure whether it's a drug or a floor covering, but they were convinced that Perkanat is something. So, um, what I mean by tellability is nothing else than sharing, just a thing being able to be copied and uh, something happening in the background, and that is digitalization. And I think that a lot of... Um, a lot happens with uh, when pe uh, people and things become networked with digitalization, globalization and moralization. This is what we're dealing with. I think um, digitalization and globalization is easy to understand, but moralization, that doesn't sound positive, does it? So I want to fine tune the term of moralizing. I think it's a direct effect of digital technologies that everything becomes a moral debate. For example, corporate social responsibility or the Pride Month that is going on at the moment that companies um, like to use for their own advantage. I think things just become laden with moral. You could also say we have moral capitalism because suddenly moral behavior it becomes important for capitalized companies. And I see more positive than negative aspects, to be honest. I think it's a progress. And I think that social media contributed to it positively and negatively. The constant communication and the moral debate that comes along, along with it. I wrote a column about this. 
erlebt beim Überfall auf die Ukraine. We just saw it when Russia attacked Ukraine. Morally, good and evil seemed as clear as ever. So that many companies not only went along with the sanctions, but even went a step further just to be able to say we're against it. Microsoft presidents um, suddenly uh, made all their websites blue and yellow. That is moralization, and I think this is an effect of the digitally connected society. And we also have a strong mechanism of change. This is a little more than two years ago. One of the world's biggest um, investors said, well, we're no longer doing coal. Of course, BlackRock is behind that. And I think that the public pressure on companies can have very positive effects. Even though um, companies are often Ich glaube, dass diese Form von Bekenntnis hypocritical about that as well. I think this kind of um, capitalism of commitment also has um, those developing effects. I think this moralization has the potential to become global. I think uh, those three movements are the most powerful movements of the past few years. And it's not a coincidence that they're all hashtags. They're hashtags because they were born from the digital social world and became um, important in the real world because of moralization. The audience, you, demand commitment from companies, or at least many people get that impression. Or companies are being held responsible if they um, become hypocritical. So this moralization also has to do with the fact that social media have to realize that their emotion engines, they've been built in order to evoke and spread emotion. And they're extremely efficient at it. And this is why I think that the feelings that are created result in moralization, positively and negatively. I don't want to paint it all positive. And at the same time, we see that these emotion engines are have powers on the other side as well. I have a nice example from 2017 that was a poll by Washington Post directly after the inauguration of Donald Trump in January 2017. So this is a photograph. And the Washington Post asked Trump voters, what do you see here? It's important to me to make it precise. Photo A is uh, Trump's inauguration and photo B is Obama's inauguration. This is the truth. But the Washington Post asked Trump voters, what is that? And 40% of them said, well, Donald Trump said that he had the greatest inauguration of all times. So, of course, photo B must be from Donald Trump's inauguration. Well, I'm not too worried about those 40%, but because it's obvious that when you see Trump's tweets, you will think this is the truth. But this tells us a lot about the emotion engine and the networking that is going on here. 15% um, of Trump voters said a is um, the Trump inauguration, but there's more people than in photo B. It's true. 15% said 
Um, there's more people on photo A than on photo B. And that is puzzling because it shows that people believe what they read on social media more than whatever they see with their own eyes. So you have a re-narrating of um, the actual truth. And we've seen it during the pandemic. So you can see there's, uh, there was arguments like um, what looks like trees is actually people and um, all kinds of um, arguments that are supposed to support the perceived fact. And um, it seems that emotions become perceived facts and then fake facts. I don't think that moralizing through social media is inherently bad, but um, you can see effects like the one I described, and you have to understand that in order to deal with it, because the change and the changes that I'm talking about of course, they have counter-movements, to put it mildly. Three enemies of um, change is what I put down here. Anti-rationalism, anti-liberalism, and gender hate. So, uh, to, to put gender hate more precisely, it's hate against people who are not cis men. So it's homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, hate against all kinds of uh, LGBTQ people. So it's nothing else than good old patriarchy. A world that was created by men for men. So Anti-liberalism is uh, very broadly and um, very much in the American sense. So it's anti-everything that is left in the widest sense. So I would count in all movements that are against liberal um, politics. So, anti-liberalism includes, for example, many forms of racism, anti-Semitism, so anything that is against a free, open and anti-discriminatory society. And anti-rationalism, this is what we probably will be hearing about when Luisa Neubauer is talking on Friday, because this is what people fighting against climate change deal with. So it's um, a form of anti-liberalism that is not far away from what we saw with Trump, but especially with the power of social media, the gender hate. Here's um, a tweet from Shua Hatemi. A mass rape as a war weapon in Ukraine, Burka, um obligation, school bans for um, girls in Afghanistan, criminalization of abortions in the U.S., women's uh, movement dramatically going down, have a nice Mother's Day. So we don't, we're not just living in times of change, but also in times where slowly but surely there is a backlash, a reactionary force that counteracts the progress we make. And if you look behind that, you can see that the diversity we're trying to achieve um, is taking place everywhere. I have a, an example from 2020 from the pandemic. The World Economic Forum found that the American financial assets are um, earned by uh, are managed by 99% um, men, and only 1.3% is managed by 
women or minorities, and this is from the World Economic Forum. So I believe that this kind of backlash is what we have to fight using our networks, because the backlash is huge. Let's look at the United States. At the very moment, abortion is attempted to be criminalized in such a devastating way. This is uh, Trump's absurd opinion of abortions, and it's becoming a truth. In 2016, he said it, and he's uh, repeated it later again. Um, women who abort are criminals. People with ovaries who abort are criminals. And they're murderers. And this is what it looks like now. So if we're talking about something like misogyny, trans hate, homophobia, uh, that is not just existent in these extreme spheres, but also deep into our society. A very simple but terrible example is one thing I found. The internet informs me on the 30th of May that Bibi Klaassen, a German influencer, has separated from her husband, which is her absolute right, and then published revealing photos in a swimsuit, which is not that unusual, but with doing that, she actually attracted the scorn of her fans. And I believe that this is very much a part of structural misogyny, so that we do not allow women to do what they want. And exactly this, in this kind of part of gender relationships, has taken on a measure that this backlash is so intense, we could also see in the Ukrainian war. One person who saw that quite early in Germany, I think among the first to say it here, was Denis Yücel, who wrote the, uh, that uh, homophobia is a war reason. He, uh, a part of the explanation why Russia invaded Ukraine really is homophobia, and mostly homosexual men. And if you don't believe that, then you have to listen to those that have ordered the invasion, which is Putin, who said exactly this. Properly speaking, in his speech, properly speaking, um, he said that Ukraine had the wrong values, that Germany, uh, sorry, that Russia was going to destroy the attitudes uh, are aggressive and that these attitudes would be brought into other countries and these were behaviors that would lead to a devaluation because they're against human nature. Uh, degradation and degeneration because they are contrary to human nature. So toxic fascist terminology here. And if that isn't clear enough for you yet because it's com not completely literal, then I will recommend this quote from the Russian patriarch, Kirill, who's or Cyril, who said, that the gay parades were the main reason for the war. And I think it is very important to understand how large this backlash, particularly regarding gender hate, is. And at the same time, we have to see that these ladening with morals doesn't always, isn't always a force for the good. There is a kind of ambiguity in this lightning or charging things with morals, because there is this trans hate, which exists, of course, among left, liberal, homosexual feminists, although we could discuss this a very long time, whether the term feminist here is actually appropriate. But I can say, I can sketch out quite clearly, one of the most mentioned people when it comes to opposing trans people and people that actually deny their existence is, of course, J.K. Rowling. And here's a quote from her. Uh, J.K. Rowling, the uh, writer of books that have sold hundreds of millions of copies around the world, has recently been cancelled in much the same way for displeasing supporters of so-called gender freedoms. So, someone was quite clearly saying here, poor J.K. Rowling was cancelled. The minute problem here is that this quote is by Vladimir Putin, and if you are in fact quoted by Vladimir Putin uh, in this way as a reason for his aggressive war, then maybe you should consider your position, to put it very carefully.
wie radikal der Backlash ist. How radical this backlash is, we could see a few years, a few days ago in an interview with uh, Helen Joyce, fairly powerful person, part of the management of the Economist, one of the or maybe the most important, most powerful economic magazine in the world, and she said on YouTube, the marking. Uh, is uh, what I borrowed from Annika Brockschmidt, who twitters under uh, a name that I didn't get. Uh, so he's saying that a person that, for a person that considers herself a feminist, uh, every trans person is a problem here. Um, this uh, woman, Helen Joyce, talks about resettling the people that have these strange needs, which are, I quote, a huge problem for the healthy world, uh, for the sane world. Uh, that is no less than fascist, in my view, clearly fascist fantasy. And And since we are at Helen Joyce, which most of you will not know, that is one item. But of course, this woman, Helen Joyce, is someone who uh, has dominated the debate on trans people in the Anglo-Saxon area because she has written a highly influential but highly toxic book, uh, Trans, where ideology meets reality, and that isn't just published in the Anglo-Saxon area. Uh, this was almost verbatim, verbatim copied by Alice Schwarzer, the famous German feminist, who says trans is now a fashion, which kind of denies existence to trans people. And there is a strange kind of uh, harmony uh, because in a very abstruse kind of way, at least I interpret it this way, she feels attracted to Vladimir Putin, or at least she can understand his arguments very well, when she says that Zelensky is not, does not stop to provoke, Zelensky will always be stopping the Russian rockets with his buildings. What an affront. Um, and you can ask, what does this have to do with digitalization of the networking? And that, this becomes clear if you regard transphobia as the kind of uh, hatred um, glue that is used as the most effective point of attack. So what we've seen earlier with these paths that were tarmacked on the lawn, this efficiency of radicalization works for those against change as well through the power of networking. And they notice where the points of attack are that are effective, that have broad effect. And here is a point where those that are more or less in agreement about progress suddenly get divided and they can be split into very new, highly toxical alliances. And because of that, from this long arc, the one demand that I keep getting back to is my body, my choice. That is unnegotiable. Non-negotiable. In exactly this context regarding abortion and the self-determination, people that have a uterus, um, the law to decriminalize abortion is highly overdue. And my body, my choice, what does that actually mean? I believe that, of course, in some, there are some gray areas there. If you convict someone to prison, that person can't say, I'm not going in there because it's my body, my choice. No, it's about particularly about body politics. And these gray areas, I'm always happy to discuss. And I would perhaps categorize it by saying that an obligation for vaccination could be acceptable, but a forced vaccination, never. So if we talk about moralizing, that is a term that, of course, is targeting wokeness, a term that is actually from the... 30s in the fight against racism that was created by black people in those times. And for me, wokeness is a good word. I refuse to understand wokeness as something bad. I think wokeness is a firm a kind of politeness put into language. I think wokeness is good. 
And of course there is a but. Because wokeness, just like every moralizing mechanism, can tip into something bad. And I call that toxic wokeness, together with Jule, my wife. I believe that toxic wokeness actually is a problem. And that is exactly when the wokeness that's actually good goes into an area where it actually does create hatred and where it maybe is exaggerated to an extent where you can't find any allies anymore for your demands. And I think it's important to understand that that exists a toxic wokeness. And again, I would like to keep up the term wokeness. More about toxic wokeness you can get from our podcast, Feel the News. I will never let you have a talk without promoting myself. We have an episode about toxic wokeness in that podcast. And if you surf 1.ly, at least if you use the Apple company and its products, you will get to that podcast. And I would recommend to subscribe to it just to try it out. You can always unsubscribe if you don't like it. But Feel the news, one.ly, for those that do not use an Apple device, you will search for feel the news or go to feelthenews.de, where every week we like to sketch out what's actually happening, and that's where the toxic wokeness term comes from. And if we talk about these mechanisms and the backlash, then we have to realize that, and I'm quoting Robert Misick, an Austrian man that, in my view, is rather to the left, but still quite reasonable in his views of the world. And he wrote in December 2021, the revolt against reason. And in fact, it's what is behind this anti-rationalist movement is just that. And now I am coming along and saying that it's first, not just, but first about a problem about conflicting 20th and 21st centuries. So the convictions of these two centuries are colliding and there is a generational a deformation, a generational deformation because people are getting more and more smart. And I'm not talking about this Flynn effect that you may have read about. It's about the fact that we as a society with each generation are becoming slightly smarter. And that is because we are coping with this progress even ever better. And we are taking it on into our own, be our own behavior. With each generation, we understand better what is actually happening out there and how. And that, of course, is a kind of daring thesis, but I will feed it with a study who would fall into the trap of fake news. And with increasing age, the probability that people recognize fake news is decreasing. And that is quite obvious to measure. And same applies to a 2016 study in the Trump campaign. The older the people were, on average, uh, the more they believed fake news and spread it. And that tells us here, we Republican people, we have a message and a mission. We Republica people are a transmission belt of these various aspects of digitalization into society. And yes, we were the digital avant-garde at some point. Maybe we're not that much anymore. Maybe we'd have to go to TinCon to see that, where the young people are. But we still have a certain power and energy, a certain understanding that society, we, the Republica people, didn't understand TikTok much earlier than others didn't. And this kind of advantage we have to use much more offensively. And this deformation, this generation deformation also includes that, uh, well, the generation Y, which I love hugely, and the generation Z. I don't know, can you still say that after Putin's war of aggression? And the generation Alpha, well, I had to Google that. How, how do you call the ones that are just being born? Now, all these, in my view, can show us the path in many ways with the power of networking, with the transformative power behind change and how to deal with that change. 
And I believe that we, the adults, have to a lot that we can copy from the Generation Z and Alpha, how they deal with digitalization, how they deal with public spaces. A, an average person that is maybe 21 years old now has spent almost 10 years with cameras, including audience reactions. So people are at the age of 21 who are so young from the perspective of most of us here in the first row, they have been looking into the camera for 10 years and with every sentence they can understand how good it was in the comments. And with every video they upload, of course, it is being measured how much these videos spread. They have a feel for that. They have a feel for the digitally networked media. And we, the generation before, the classic boomers, we are still stupidly watching measures that they know from the 20th century. I almost freaked out when I noticed in 2021 that this headline here was published. Young people are spending more than 70 hours online per week. And and of course, how can you actually measure this? That I found incredible because it's so misleading. In particular, they spend time at the smartphone. Of course, surprise, surprise, we presented them a world where the smartphone is the crystallization point of the digital world. Where else should they be? And of course, it's a lot of fun, you have to say. But I believe that even us in the matrix, the boomers, if we publish stats on the times that young people spend online, the intensity has consequences. And... These consequences manifest themselves in the business models that, in that change, are the most successful by far. I believe that the social, digital and economic change cannot be separated through platforms. So the most successful business models in the digital change, platforms such as the one that spread social media content, that are regulated through the power of networking. And the fact that this cannot be separated is seen in the incredible power that these platforms have gathered. And that tells us a story, maybe even in this room, but outside would be surprising. Let's look at the digital advertising market of last year. There are some companies, four to be precise, that use platform principles, so they use the power of digital networking and that have harvested this. These are Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. If you look at digital advertising in 2021, the overall volume is $491 billion, and this is the uh, split. I can add a legend. So the four companies that use platform principles, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, took three quarters of the whole advertising volume online across the whole world. And all the other companies put together only have a quarter. Microsoft, by the way, is more a symbol, uh, a few billions there. You could actually do without them. Google, Facebook, and Amazon actually are the ones that really have this huge fish because they understood how exactly this power of effect, this present uh, effectivity is created. And it's not, that's not, not just in the digital sphere because the platform principles also work elsewhere. Let's look at a market that is extremely important for Germany. Germany, and this is how it looks. I'm now moving away from revenue and onto stock market value. So I have here on the one side you see $1,260 billion and $980 billion on the other side. So $1.2 trillion against $980 billion. And reality is kind of crass because it shows the power of platforms because this is about the market capitalization of automobiles mobile producers, and there is one producer where you assume that they understood uh, platform power, and that is Tesla, of course, and these $1,260 billion actually is Tesla, and the blue $980 billion, these are the following 20 most valuable car makers in the world put together. So that is the power of change that is effective elsewhere, and I believe that this cannot be separated.
And at the same time, you have to see that we in the EU still haven't found how platforms can truly be regulated, although they have this huge power. We are still bumbling and people want to unbundle things and still and actually don't know what that actually means and how this power can be tamed democratically and it becomes even ever more effective uh, into ever more sectors of society, also regarding society and the public, because the power of public uh, is so massive that many people, even in this room, don't realize. The people out there on the stream don't surely realize it. We are quite clear, here is an article from New Yorker, we are watching the world's first TikTok war. That is not my personal opinion. It's not my personal opinion that TikTok is an extremely important platform on um, the war, the ongoing war. But uh, the Washington Post, uh, the, the White House was briefing TikTok stars about the war in Ukraine because incredibly many young people use TikTok as an information medium. TikTok is highly problematic in brackets because it's a Chinese um, company that is um, bound by the dictatorship in China, but it's um, a reflection of what is going on in young heads. And, well, the fact that this is a Chinese company, you can see why this is so problematic. TikTok um, creates its own universe in Russia. There's no permeability to the outside. There's a fraction of TikTok within Russia where, well, Putin's propaganda is just taking us facts. So, we know that in Germany, TikTok is influencing public opinion. And this is where you have to look closely. Because if so many people use TikTok as an information medium and they're right to do so, it means something. It doesn't mean nothing. And we see how connected the um, kinds of suppression are when TikTok admitted in 2009 that it suppressed certain opinions of queer, fat and disabled creators because they weren't deemed as favorable and they were just suppressed. So when TikTok has influence on our opinion formation and there are so-called finfluencers, so people are educating themselves on finance on TikTok and music industry is also becoming dependent on TikTok. We can see where the cultural pressure has to be increased. So I don't want to use judiciary terms, but, um, well, things like concentration camps, for example, don't make it big on TikTok. Or I would like to use uh, Tiananmen Square. So we have an interesting form of state toxic wokeness that China um, included in the propaganda machine. So this is a publication from the platform where the press um, spokesperson of the state council regularly informs China, colon, democracy that works. And in fact, a part of Chinese um, propaganda is that anything the West says is colonialist opinion forming. Um, they're trying to force something on us that we don't want. We have our Chinese-style democracy, and it's better than yours. And anyone who says, mm, well, I imagined democracy differently is attacked as being colonialist. And I think this is state-driven toxic wokeness that we have to 
um, be aware of. And we need to be aware of that because we have to see how linked into the digital sphere we already have our um, connectedness to the platforms is exploitable and this is something we love about the platforms our emotional connecting uh, connection with the digital sphere so, to outline it shortly for the end, so I brought you a platform as an example for this connectedness that um, is the most successful um, platform and is hugely successful. And, of course, I'm talking about smart speakers, the digital assistants in the smart speakers, such as Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. Since Christmas last year in Germany, there have been more than 10 million smart speakers. So statistically, there's people who in the 80s um, protested against um, the census and who buy um, who basically bug their own house today. And of course, I have one of those bugs myself in my house, and the term is unfair. And one of them um, only responds to Alexa, and only if the, the one speaker responds, the other is even called. So if you're afraid of Alexa, and this is your right. The only thing that protects you is trust in the provider, in this case Amazon. But the same applies to the device we all have in our pockets, the smartphone. Back to Alexa. I found a study that I found very interesting in this context. Digital emotional connectedness to connectivity. Children who grow up with Alexa see Alexa as a family member. So they see Alexa as a digital family member. And we as adults can say, how cute, young, naive children. I don't believe so. I think children are just imitating us. They are just imitating what they're seeing in us. And this is a proof of the intelligence of the younger generation. They see us pretending it's just a tool to switch on and off to the lights, but they see how we act and interact with digital devices and have them become an emotional part of us. And even if our baby's hungry, we take it to the next power outlet and feed it, our little baby. So I think that is a nice closing point to show how digital connectedness has become an emotional thing for us. There was a study on normal adults like me and you, and they were asked to go to the other room and to switch off a robot in that room. And what they didn't know was that the robot started talking uh, when they um, entered the room and um, he said, please don't shut me off. I'm afraid to never um, be switched on again. And a third of people just didn't manage to switch off the robot because they had compassion with the robot. So this is the depth of the emotional connectedness with the digital sphere that we already have. And this is why it's our mission. Why are we here? We've been the digital avant-garde all this time. And we should go out and help 
the current coalition and the world to manage the changes. You look like activists. You talk like activists. You act like an activists. I've never seen a room full of people with less billionaires. So set Olaf Scholz under pressure tomorrow and every minister tell them to get this shit done in Europe and in the world. Thank you so much for your attention.